Thanks to my patrons for supporting my channel. So this wasn't a video I was planning to make. I've been trying to commit myself to more long form in-depth videos. I didn't have time to talk about the Borderlands movie, I've not even played the games. Sure it looked uh, not great, but whatever, I have more important things to talk about. And then it debuted with a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. And with such a resounding testament to its quality, I simply had to see it. So I went into the theater expecting some true awfulness, and yet I was still not prepared. Borderlands 2024 is abysmal. Take it from someone whose last video was saying, come on guys, the Acolyte isn't that bad. Borderlands is that bad. It makes the Five Nights at Freddy's movie look like Ridley Scott's Alien. It makes the Mario movie look like the tale of the Princess Kaguya. It was a soul-suckingly awful and empty experience that I would never wish any living sapient creature to ever sit through. And it left me with one question. What the hell happened here? So I actually took a cursory look over the Wikipedia page for the movie. Apparently, Lee Winnell was originally attached to the project. Honestly, a perfect choice. Looking at his work on Upgrade, I think it'd be feasible for him to make a leap into bigger budget sci-fi like this. But then, he was quietly dropped from the project. The final script seems to have originated in 2020 from Craig Mazin. Mazin's credits include writing for Scary Movie 3, Scary Movie 4, The Hangover Part 2, The Hangover Part 3, and creating, writing, and producing the HBO miniseries Chernobyl. Wait, what the fuck? And he created the Last of Us series? So he can put together a good video game adaptation. So what happened? Well, Joe Crombie happened. Don't look him up, you won't find anything about him because he doesn't exist. Why is he in the writing credits for Borderlands then? Well, Mason's script went through so many rewrites from so many people and was taken out of his hand so much that he requested his name removed from the project altogether. Instead, the credit went to an Alan Smithy style fake name, and Mason even specifically confirmed that no, Crombie wasn't a pseudonym he intended to keep using. He just wanted his name off of this thing. And can you blame him? Reports are coming in that the movie was originally filmed to be rated R and then got cut down to a PG-13 rating. Reshoots happened under a completely different director, accompanied by more rewrites. There is a marriage between two characters, Hammerlock and Jacobs, I don't know if that means anything to you Borderlands fans out there, who are just not in the final product at all. Also two characters, Scooter and Ellie, were cast and filmed and then they were cut out. This movie was, to put it mildly, a shit show. And you can see it in the final product. Spoilers, but honestly, who gives a damn? Don't watch this anyways. So Borderlands the movie follows bounty hunter Lilith, who was born on the world of Pandora, not that one, which is the ruins of an ancient precursor alien race. There's a secret vault on the planet which has super crazy alien technology and everyone wants it but nobody can find the vault or its three hidden keys. However, there is a prophecy that a chosen one descended from the precursors will be able to open the vault. Gee, I wonder if it's going to be the hard-boiled Lilith who has few legitimate prospects in her life. Any players of the game will have already realized this follows almost none of the original game's storyline. There's a few elements nominally intact, like the fact that there is a vault on Pandora, and the main character is named Lilith, but talking to DM, he's the guy that does my subtitles, say hi DM, he was telling me about the ways the game and the movie diverge, and it's in pretty much everything. To be clear, an adaptation doesn't have to be fully accurate to the source material. Changes being made to characters and settings are okay, and sometimes even beneficial, if it helps a story fit into a new medium. But if you leave an interesting story on the table and deliver something worse, you get penalty points in my eyes for wasting perfectly good ideas. If the changes made make the story less interesting and more generic than what we started out with, then yeah, I don't like that. It also doesn't help that these people are miscast. Don't get me wrong, I love Kate Blanchett's work, but when I think of Kate Blanchett acting, I think of her as an ethereal ancient elf lady, or an arrogant and manipulative world-famous conductor, or hell, I'll rope the Soviet psychic in there. I don't picture a scrappy, tough-talking bounty hunter with a chip on her shoulder. Honestly, I think the line she delivered with the most heart was, I don't want to be here, nothing personal. The movie ends with Lilith getting superhuman powers that let her just steamroll the bad guys, shield her friends from further attacks, and just win because she was lucky enough to be the chosen one. 
Apparently in the games, she's something called a siren. I cannot recall the word siren being used once in the movie. Her powers really feel like they're pulled out at the last second. Lilith in the games was altruistic and didn't rush to violence. Well, screw that. She's dropping people in the bar just for annoying her. Tiny Tina goes from being competent and lethal but insane, according to DM, to a kid who just goes on and on about how special they are with no way to back that up, which gets annoying really fast. And the rest of the characters here are shockingly barren. And I say shockingly because even if the movie wasn't trying to flesh out these characters, you would think, with the screen time they get, we would accidentally wander across some defining character traits for them. But I can barely tell you anything about Roland, or Krieg, or Mad Moxie, or Dr. Tannis. In fact, I can't even tell you their names. I had to look them up because they made that little impression on me. Though, I will admit this, there is one character I do remember. One character I remember very, very, very well. I'm going to hazard a guess that Claptrap isn't supposed to be one of the most aggravating characters in all of fiction, but that's what the movie gave us. I know Jack Black can be funny, I know he can voice act, but the voice he picked just did not work well. I've heard some people say that his voice is modulated after the fact, and I would like to believe it, because again, Jack Black is typically pretty good at this. It doesn't help him, of course, that the script is awful. There's two main problems they have with it. The first, related to Claptrap, is an over-reliance on bathos. Bathos is when a dramatic situation is undercut by comedy. A good example of bathos is this moment here. Your salvation is at hand. Be yeah! Things are gonna get easier. But the key difference is that Guardians of the Galaxy manages to balance its use of comedy. It still allows emotional moments to leave an impact. You know, because it's a good movie. Every time, every time the Borderlands movie attempts to have some shred of story beat, it's undercut. And 99% of the time, it's undercut by Claptrap. Lilith gets a message from her mother confirming that she really did care about her daughter. And then right when the moment ends, oh, wow, I blacked out there. I sure hope nothing important just happened. And that's not just me sarcastically summarizing the line. That's almost verbatim how it goes. Man, maybe I was too harsh on Joss Whedon's Justice League. I really cannot emphasize enough how badly done this element of the movie is. There's a part where they're trying to sneak into some sewers, and every human character stops and goes, Wait, look, there's a flower growing down here. Hope blooms. Which is not in character for any of them. So right away you know this moment only exists to be undercut as a comedic subversion. And then I was right. Wow, what a surprise. Hey, remember how the Dungeons & Dragons movie last year managed to adapt its source material into a fun, lighthearted adventure that didn't need to break its characters to tell jokes? And also its jokes were good and funny? I did not laugh once through the Borderlands movie. I did not smile. I did not snort. I did not even manage a nose exhale. This movie cannot even be defended as turn your brain off dumb fun because it is not fun. It is a misery inducing nightmare that actively made my life worse. I only have precious limited time in this mortal realm, and I chose to spend some of it on Borderlands 2024, and I will forever suffer because of that. And I haven't even gotten to the actual storytelling yet. You've heard of movies that follow the rule tell don't show, but you've seen nothing yet. So there's a scene where Kate Blanchett sees some bad guys forcing some kids into some cages. She shoots the cage open and shoots the bad guy to let the kids go free. Alright, we see that despite her hard-boiled exterior up to this point, she does still have a capacity for kindness and sympathy. We do not need Claptrap to then say, and again, I'll try to recall this verbatim, Oh wow! He shot the cage open and let those kids free! That is so out of character for you! I just thought you were mean all the way through! Jack Blackhoney, I am so sorry they did this to you. When she arrives on Pandora, Kate Blanchett just narrates through her arrival. And then I talked to some kids and found out where I needed to go. And then I got what I needed from this guy and picked up these supplies here. What? What are you doing? This is the part where instead of taking the time to tell us, oh yeah, this planet is terrible, this planet is dangerous, people get hurt on this planet because it's bad, you show that 
through her interactions with the environment and the people around her. You know, like a movie. And I have a hunch that might have been the original intention before the rewrite and reshoots took place, because you can tell that voice lines have been added in post-production. You can tell that things were dubbed over after the fact. And you can also tell that things were cut. So there's this one woman working for the bad guys. I don't remember her name, so I had to look it up. Uh, Commander Knox. Apparently that means something to you folks who played the game. She has two scenes in the movie. First scene, she is looking for the heroes intent on wiping them out. And then her second scene before the climax, where, out of nowhere, she suddenly objects to the use of lethal force and then gets incinerated. You can't build an arc out of only two points. I looked at the fan wiki to make sure I was thinking of the right person, and I find it hilarious that this is all that's written about her. I assure you, this isn't just a stub because the movie just came out. This is, in fact, a comprehensive account of her entire presence in the film. Maybe she was involved in that marriage ceremony, or maybe she was in the rated R scenes. Maybe they just forgot her in reshoots. Maybe they should go back for another round. So there's this other scene in the movie where, uh-oh, the scene got found out thanks to Claptrap being an idiot again, and the bad guys have them surrounded. How are they going to get out of this one? Smash cut to them in a dumpster being wheeled away to safety. Is there any way out of here that doesn't involve garbage? No. Was that meant to be a joke? Was that meant to be a consolation prize for a, I'll be generous and call it a sequence, where we don't get to see who came up with the idea, where we don't get any tension built up, where we don't get to see how the characters act under pressure or how they resolve conflicts. You know, the basic little sparks you need for telling a story. God, I hate this movie so much. Anyway, so the plot of the movie is that they need to find three keys in the child of the precursors and also find where the vault is. There you go, that's your checklist for the plot, right? Well, not exactly. See, they have the one person already, at least who they think is the person, and they also have one key. Okay, so two of the five tasks are already done before the protagonist comes on board. Let's go get the second key, but it could be anywhere in this giant warehouse. I wonder how we're going to find it. Kate Blanchett found it. She just uses the force and walks right to where the key is. Wow, great, what a convenient ability. I wonder if maybe she's the chosen one rather than Tiny Tina. That would be totally unexpected anyway, so now we have three of the tasks done. We still need a third key and to find the vault in- uh, uh, Oh, what's that? The two keys show them exactly where the vault is? And the third key is actually the chosen one? Oh, 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 hold on a second. You said three keys and the chosen one. So th that's it. One mission and we're just ready to go to the climax. Man, maybe I was too harsh on the Rise of Skywalker. And look, I could keep going like this. I could point out how stupid it is that Tina thinks Kate Blanchett betrayed her when she said openly that she had been hired by Atlas. I could point out how infuriating it is that they get saved at the last moment from an out of control elevator by a character randomly discovering they could teleport. I could point out how badly the climax is handled when Jamie Lee Curtis tells Tina, I have to warn you, opening the vault might kill you. And then she just shrugs it off. I could go on and on and on about how every attempt to tell even a fraction of a story fails in this movie, but you know what? I think you get the point. I've gotten so far into the script I've not even mentioned the visuals yet, but do I really need to? You've been looking at the visuals. Unless you've been listening to this video instead, in which case, trust me, you're not missing much. The games had this Sobel filter look to them to simulate a graphic novel. It was unique, it gave them an identity. I could see any screenshot of the game and name it, despite never playing them. Could they have pulled it off for this movie? Maybe pull a Joel Haver approach in post-production and give it a similar unique look? I don't know. I don't know if it would have worked for a feature-length production. But it couldn't have been worse than what we got. The movie looks so bad. Nothing is convincing. The most charitable explanation I can think of is that they're angling for a tongue-in-cheek approach where it's not really supposed to look real. It's supposed to look bad on purpose. But that's not an excuse. You can get away with it more easily if you're a scrappy project with a tiny budget, but in any case, you still have to have some spirit to it. And Borderlands has neither of those things. With a budget of $120 million, this is just unacceptable.
Maybe I was too harsh on Quantumania. And I want to reiterate what I always say. Bad visual effects does not mean the artists were lazy. Bad visual effects are a symptom of a chaotic and rushed creative process that is not given the time needed to coalesce. A production so chaotic and rushed that some of the visual effects crew weren't even credited. What an absolute dumpster fire. The only single thing I can say is decent are the costumes. But that's not enough to budge my rock bottom opinion of the movie overall. Borderlands 2024 is absolutely the worst film of the year and is a contender for worst of the decade. It should not be watched by anybody. Fans of the game won't like it because of how much it screws up the lore. Fans of good movies won't like it because obviously. And you wanna know something really sad? Fans of bad movies shouldn't even watch it. And I say this as a fan of bad movies. I had an absolute ball with Madam Web earlier this year, but I experienced no joy through the entirety of Borderlands. It is an utter atrocity, a waste of valuable economic resources, an insult to the movie going public and anyone of decent taste. The executives of Lionsgate and Take-Two should be ashamed of themselves for unleashing this monstrosity upon the world, and given the abysmal box office take that the release is facing, they'll learn their lesson to never, ever do this again. Wait, what do you mean Take-Two already has another adaptation in the works? Well, what game are they- OH GOD NO!